You're listening to the BBM Global Network with 25 years in broadcast audio and video production. Our passionate team creates content and marketing for the world of Internet talk radio. If you've got a passion, come join us at BBMGlobalNetwork.com. The BBM Global Network. Your voice is now heard. for over 35 years brings her experience to your ministry be it energizing your staff or working through conflicts with your faith community so now please welcome the host of a flame ministry pastor kathleen panning Welcome. This is a Flame Ministry, and you are listening here on the BBM Global Network and Tune In Radio. I am your host, Pastor Kathleen Panning. And as I start out each show, kind of reminding everyone, in case this is your first time listening, this is a show uh, for those who are in ministry, meaning if you're a professional in ministry or if you are a member of a faith community and working in that community and any kind of capacity, actually, um, even, I mean, volunteer as well as paid, and, you know, whatever you do, um, it's for you. And we always try to think about two different things, sometimes focusing more on one than the other. And those are trying to build bridges between faiths. This is an interfaith show. And so when possible, we try to build some bridges between faiths uh, and dispel misconceptions. But we also work on talking about issues of ministry that are probably common to most, if not all, faiths because they are issues about people. And faith and ministry is about people. Uh, my guest today is um, Mary Campbell, and Mary is the program director for AMPARO, uh, and we'll explain a little bit more what that acronym stands for in a few moments, but this is a strategy of the Evangelical Lutheran Church in America to accompany migrant minors uh, and in certain ways, and it was passed overwhelmingly uh, at the 2016 Churchwide Assembly or Convention. And uh, Mary's work currently involves organizing congregational and synodical engagement with migrant children and families, as well as pro bono legal work on their behalf. Her legal career has involved work in international human rights and civil and criminal work in both the United States and El Salvador. Uh, Mary was an ELCA missionary for five years in El Salvador. Salvador in the Department of Human Rights for the, and please pardon my Spanish, I'm not a Spanish speaker, but for the Iglesia Luterana Salvadorina, which I believe means Salvadoran Lutheran Church. So, Mary, welcome. It's great to have you with us today. Thank you for having me. Um, please tell us what is Amparo. Well, Amparo, for people who are Spanish speakers, um, is a well-known word, which means refuge. It comes from Psalm 46. God is our refuge and strength. Dios es nuestro amparo y fortaleza. Um, and when we were thinking about um, a strategy to accompany migrant minors, uh, we were especially thinking about the refuge um, possibility and, and the words that we could use to uh, explain what Amparo is. Um, if you know Spanish, you know that Amparo has one M usually, but in our case, it stands for Accompanying Migrant Minors with Protection, Advocacy, Representation, and Opportunities. And this really is a strategy that is intended to be a holistic whole church response. Holistic in the sense that we talk about activities around protection, advocacy, representation, and opportunities, 
but also whole church in the sense that it involves all of our synods and congregations and members, but it's also ecumenical in the sense that we, uh, we collaborate um, with all of our ecumenical partners, uh, Presbyterian Church, um, Episcopal Church, and many, many other denominations throughout the different networks that we participate in. Uh, why was Amparo started? What Amparo was, the was started as a result purposes? of our church's recognition of itself as a community of faith and uh, the 92 verses in the Bible in which God um, exhorts us to uh, accompany our, our and welcome the foreigners and the strangers among us. Um, and so um, one of the things, one of the resources that we have available is a bookmark that um, allows people to read one of the 40 of those 92 verses, one a day, and actually pray and think about what this means and what is God asking you personally to do to accompany the strangers and the migrants um, and the foreigners in your community. Um, and so um, in, in 2014, um, our church has long been engaged around immigration ministry, but primarily through the Lutheran Immigration and Refugee Service, in which we still collaborate with them at this point in time. Um, but there felt like there was a need for the ELCA in the time when many children and families were crossing um, our border, our southern border, coming into the United States, um, to take a, a stronger position around um, um, accompanying the migrants that are coming into our communities. And so uh, after the two executive directors for domestic and global mission had a chance um, to see the work that was happening at the border and also in Central America, um, they began um, to, they formulated a small group to work together to, uh, to write a strategy. Um, we were able to have the input of all of our companions and ecumenical partners as we did so. Uh, it went through our internal church structures, it went through our conference of bishops and our church council, and finally came to the churchwide assembly in 2016, as you mentioned earlier, where it was overwhelmingly adopted in a vote of 922 to 11, which is probably one of the highest resolutions or, uh, that's, or strategies that's ever uh, received that kind of a vote um, in the ELCA. Yeah, that's really interesting. Uh, and as I was thinking about that this morning, um, it, it it you know went back into my memory that the Evangelical Lutheran Church in America and the Lutheran Church in the United States, no matter what denomination it's part of, is really um, immigrant rooted, uh, and most of the Lutherans in this country, in the United States, have um, ancestors that came from um, places like Norway and Sweden and the Scandinavian countries and Germany and and areas around there. And I'm, I don't know that this is fact or anything like that, but most of the Lutherans I know remember their immigrant ancestors and those roots and have stories for that. So I'm thinking maybe that had something to do with the... Um, the way that this church has uh, embraced this idea of welcoming others. And yes, I, really I don't know do if anybody's... That that's, a, that's definitely a factor. You know, we are an immigrant nation, you know, and we are, as the ELCA, definitely an immigrant church. Yeah. Um, so as we think about this, um, you know, I know little bits of the stories of why my ancestors came to this country. But what are the factors now for uh, those who are wanting to come to this country? What, what are some of the causes, the root causes for immigration? Right now, we identify principally four root causes. Number one is violence, um, particularly in Honduras and El Salvador um, and in certain parts of Mexico. People are fleeing because of the violence that they're experiencing through um, the gangs in their community. Uh, sometimes it's as a result of domestic violence that's um, not protected um, in certain places. Um, and, and, and so violence is the principal cause. Uh, secondary cause are economic reasons, and we've long seen that. I mean, many of us um, have ancestors that came for economic reasons, and people are still coming today for those same reasons. 
Climate change, though, is something that's new. Uh, we see more now on um, the isthmus, particularly in Central America, is subject to flooding and also subject to droughts. And sometimes the same country can have sections that suffer from flooding and other sections suffering from drought at the same time. And so what this causes is a great deal of vulnerability for people, especially in rural communities who are engaged in agriculture and being able to um, con consistently um, provide food for their families. In addition to that... Um, and we're going to have to take a... Yeah, we're going to have to... Do we're going to have to take a break right now, but uh, we'll come back with the fourth of those reasons uh, for immigration when we come back. So um, this is the BBM Global Network and Tune In Radio. Stay tuned. We're coming right back. Welcome. Psychologist, master certified coach and CEO of the executive and organizational development firm True North Leadership, Dr. Relly Nadler brings his expertise in emotional intelligence to keynotes, consulting, coaching, and training. He is the author of Leader's Playbook and Leading with Emotional Intelligence that lays out tips and tools for effective leadership. Dr. Nadler has designed multi-day executive boot camps for high achievers in Fortune 500 companies and has coached CEOs, presidents, and their staff and developed and delivered innovative leadership programs for such organizations as Anheuser-Busch, BMW, MCI, EDS, DreamWorks Animation, the U.S. Navy, and Vanguard Health Systems. To learn more and get your free iPhone app highlighting his tools with videos, leadership keys, visit www.truenorthleadership.com today. Joseph A. Moylan is the owner of Ion Health, which specializes in very unique medical devices. Ion Health offers biomats, alkalife, and frequency machines. Biomats are a far infrared and negative ion emitting FDA approved medical device. With many different sizes available, you can place them on your bed, on a massage table, or on a seat in your car. It is an unobtrusive way to health. Alkalife machines are water ionizers that cleanse and raise the alkalinity of your tap water, making high alkaline water. Frequency machines utilize certain frequencies to kill viruses and bacteria. These devices are safe and effective. Coming from a health-conscious background and studying physiology at the Academy of Natural Health, Joseph A. Moylan has 15 years of experience in the health field and wants to help you live a healthy, long life. Visit www.ionhealthbiomats.weebly.com or call 765-520-2988. Don't let your health go astray. Get in touch today. Well, welcome back. You are listening to a Flame Ministry here on the BBM Global Network and Tune In Radio. I am your host, Pastor Kathleen Panning, and my guest today is Mary Campbell, who is the program director for Amparo, which is a program in the Evangelical Lutheran Church in America uh, of accompanying migrant minors in, in various ways. Um, and before the break, Mary, you were telling us the four main reasons why people want to immigrate to the United States. And you talked about uh, violence as number one, and second was economic reasons, and third was something new, which is climate change. And you were giving some examples and talking about that before you get to the fourth one. So please continue. The fourth cause is internal displacement. And what happens is that mo most times people make a decision that they do not want to uh, migrate outside of their country. They will find, try to see if they can find safety within their own country. Um, unfortunately, um, because of the nature of the gangs um, being in many, many places all the, all, the, all the way through the countries, people are not able to find that kind of safety, and so they end up coming to the United States. Um, there's a, there are a couple stories that I can tell you uh, that I've heard, you know, from people who have recently come to the United States um, having to do partic particularly mm -hmm. with the area of violence. Um, one is a, a woman from Honduras who came with her two young daughters. She and her husband owned a store in their community. And um, at one point, uh, one of the gang members came to the store basically asking them to pay a quota so that's, a, that's an amount of money on a, on a weekly basis so that they could continue operation in the community. Um, and um, they were not, they, they tried to pay that quota. And, um, and one of the days that when they were expected to pay it, 
one of the gang members actually came to their store, came inside. He noticed that they had cameras, um, security cameras in the store, and they said, oh, well, he said, well, I can see that you're taking pictures of me. He said, but don't worry, I'm not worried about that because the police already know who we are and they won't mess with us. So hello, everybody, you know, on the camera. Um, and as a result of that, um, they were the, she and her family were extremely fearful. Um, this particular gang member um, was actually stalking her, her 19-year-old daughter, and um, her, her daughter was unable to sleep anymore. Her daughter was afraid of what was going to be happening next. And so she and her daughters, two daughters, came to the United States. Her, her husband chose to stay behind initially, but when we had an opportunity to, come, to talk with him, he said that the, the quotas kept going up and up and up. There were no alternatives, and he too felt like there, was no, there were no alternatives for him to continue to live in the community. Um, in other places, there are, we, we know of other women, in, in Guatemala particularly, who have been subject to domestic violence um, and basically have tried to report it and have been told that there's no possibility of, of them receiving any kind of relief um, for, that, for that reason and because of that made, have made decisions to come to the United States. Um, and so it's, often, it's oftentimes um, maybe not the governmental authorities who have caused the, the harm, but people looking for asylum because the government authorities cannot protect them. And so that, that leads people to have to leave. Um, particularly in terms of climate change, um, we, have, um, we know of many people in different places in El Salvador who have lost crops over the years as a result of flooding, as a result of droughts, and have no longer been able to have, you know, each time they go through, they, they, have to, they have to borrow money in order to be able to start the growing season, and then finding themselves falling deeper and deeper in debt as they lose crops um, to, for one reason or another there, who find themselves in, in a place where they're, it's no longer viable and, and feel like they, they need to leave, also having lost um, homes and other facilities. Um, so people, it's, it's not a question of people just wanting to take an adventure. Um, recently, our presiding bishop, Elizabeth Eaton, had an opportunity to visit Honduras. And um, she said, although she knew this before, um, she said one of the main uh, messages that she came back with uh, to, for, after talking with many, many people, um, and it's and clearly something she knew before as well, is that people don't just um, take this migrant journey to, to have an adventure. People really are doing it because they need to save their lives. Wow. It, it, that's just, uh, you know, to hear the human stories behind this uh, makes it um, real uh, and a realization that, no, uh, th these people are not just, you know, on a lark saying, oh, I want to come to the United States. This is a, a dangerous, perilous journey and one of last resort for these folks. So um, thank you for sharing that. Um, what's the impact of this kind of a an uprooting, a, a change having on the the children and the families that are involved in this? Well, it's, it's the the impact is huge because you're talking about even in the some of the stories I told separation of families. Um, you know where where if a, if sometimes it's when one family member has been threatened, um, there's not a possibility of the whole family coming because if the family doesn't have the resources to do that, and so you often you you see separation of families happen um, on a on a regular basis, and and it's 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 extremely. It, you know, sad to, to think about somebody who might make this migrant journey to the United States um, and depending on what happens with their legal status, um, not being able to ever see their family members again. Um, I've got a, a, a really good friend um, who, who made the migrant journey um, to the United States, and it was actually 20 years before her mother actually could get a visa to come to the United States and see her. And it was joyous, you know, when, when oh. she finally had that opportunity to see her mother um, after all of this time, because she's mm -hmm. not she's in a not undocumented status and can't and can't visit. And her mother had been denied a visa many, many times. Um, so families families have to families suffer a separation. 
Um, people who go to take the migrant journey have to be very, very resilient people. Um, many people who have taken the migrant journey and recounted to me the experience will say to me, um, I know God was with me. And, and when I hear their stories, mm-hmm. I know that that's true. Yeah, but we have to take another break, but we have so much more to cover, like what Amparo is and how congregations are involved. So this is a flame ministry on the BBM Global Network and Tune In Radio. Stay tuned. We're coming right back. Renaissance woman, trailblazer, maverick. Those are just some of the words to describe to Chandra Poulard, owner and CEO of House of Virgo Entertainment, LLC, a woman minority veteran owned entertainment company based in Washington, D.C. Ms. Poulard served 10 years honorably in the United States Navy and departed from active duty to pursue her dreams of becoming an entertainment mogul. House of Virgo Entertainment offers script writing, producing, directing, DJ services, editing, and more. They cater to businesses, corporations, college students, working professionals, aspiring artists and nonprofit organizations, and employ veterans of the armed forces. Tashandra Poulard is pioneering the way we view media and taking her brand global. Visit her at www.houseofvirgoentertainment.com or call 281-515-3740 and like her on Facebook at House of Virgo Entertainment, LLC. Certified professional coach Pamela Reeves can help you with your relationships. Motivational and image coaching are just some of the ways she can help you enhance all aspects of your life. Her book, Is It Love or Merely a Sick Attachment?, helps readers clearly distinguish healthy, loving relationships from toxic ones. Ms. Reeves has put her words into action through Ray of Hope Kenya, an international initiative that provides outreach to victims of abusive relationships there with the goal of helping them rebuild their lives and the tools to avoid abuse. Ms. Reeves operates various business interest through her umbrella network, Nella LLC, and credits her success to her diverse work experience. Whatever your goals, whether striking a balance, reinventing your image, or simply lifting your lifestyle, Pamela Reeves will help you achieve them. Your life, your call. Dial 410-902-5715 or email Pamela at pamreg01 at verizon.net. She's also on the web at pamreeves.com and on Twitter at Pamela underscore Reeves. We are back here on um, the BBM Global Network and Tune In Radio, and this is A Flame Ministry, and I am your host, Pastor Kathleen Panning. My guest today is Mary Campbell, who is the program director for Amparo, uh, which is a program in the Evangelical Lutheran Church in America about accompanying migrant minors in uh, some very specific ways. And so we've talked about uh, Mary, some of the root causes of immigration today. Uh, what is, um, when we think about Amparo, what, what does that do? How are uh, congregations and people involved in this? How many? And those kinds of things. Well, one of the things that's really been outstanding through this last three-year process of, of developing the Amparo strategy is that we now have an Amparo network that includes not only um, churches and organizations in countries of origin and transit, but also a network of congregations and synods in the United States that participate. At this moment in time, we have 131 welcoming and sanctuary ELCA and other denominational um, congregations that have come, have affiliated with the Amparo Network. Um, These welcoming Well, sanctuary is is something that is somewhat more well-known, I think, among our people. Um, But we have, we but uh, welcoming congregations make four commitments. They make a commitment to physically accompany migrants in their community. This might be through going to an ICE check-in or or helping them find the services they need for medical care or for school services. Um, It involves spiritually accompanying people, praying, and advocating. Um, and so that's um, that's basically what uh, the congregation, welcoming congregations, um, commit to. We also have Amparo um, and Sanctuary Synods in the, in, in the ELCA at this moment in time. And the synods have created task forces or Amparo um, groups that are um, uh, busily engaged in, um, in accompanying migrants in their own communities. 
Um, so at this at this moment, it's just exciting to be able to say we have 131 congregations, and 37 synods at least have something going on in terms of a bottle, um, either through a task force or through something or or a congregation. Um, these congregations, um, we ask them to look to the migrant community organizations in their area and find out what those migrant community organizations are trying to do to help protect um, the people in their community and to engage in the work with their community. We don't ask them to reinvent the wheel and come up with their own plan, um, but we know that in every community there are migrants and there, and there are organizations that they can work with in order to help people uh, to accompany people in their communities. So when you're talking about doing this work, you're not necessarily talking about housing somebody who has an illegal status, um, from what I'm understanding. Is that correct? Well, sanctuary congregations will will um, actually house people. And at this moment in time, we have three congregations in the ELCA that are housing people, but they are not in an illegal status. All three of the people um, uh, or the congregations that are housing people um, are housing people that have lawyers and that are proceeding through their legal process at this moment in time. So as long as um, their people are proceeding through their process, they are not, they, they cannot be categorized as being illegal. Um, but we, the welcoming okay. congregations don't necessarily house people um, there are two kinds of sanctuary congregations. There are sanctuary hosting and sanctuary supporting. Um, and mainly the hosting are, are congregations that feel they have the capacity to house people. Uh, supporting congregations do not feel that they have that capacity, but will walk with congregations in their community that do have the capacity to house others. So... For those, the majority that are not sanctuary congregations, what are some of the very practical day-to-day types of activities that they get involved with with these uh, migrant minors and families? We have a congregation in Decorah, Iowa, that's working with 12 young people who are going through a special process called the uh, Special Immigrant Juvenile Visa Program. Um, and this is kind of complicated because they not only have to go to state family courts, but they have to go to immigration courts. And so this congregation is helping these 12 young people negotiate this process. That means helping them make sure that they get all the requirements that are needed for, for their various court processes. But they also help them make sure that they are able to do well in school and, and be able to continue with the the work that they need to do, you know, in order to graduate so that they can become productive members of their communities. Um, we have other congregations um, that are engaged in, um, in in walking with particular families through their court processes, people who have um, come to them and, um, and who need their support. We have congregations um, that actually provide legal clinics um, so that people can, uh, in their community, can come and and have a pre-consultation with an immigration lawyer to find out is there a way for them to gain legal status in the United States. But there are a variety of ways that congregations can get involved. We have some congregations that participate in interfaith networks in in their cities. Um, There's a particular program in one of the cities in the United States where, um, where when people are going to court, um, they send out a message saying, pack the court, and whoever is available on that day will make sure they get there and, and go to court because often people find that the presence of, of people watching the immigration process will, will help, um, um, help people get a better result in the sense that when judges know that people are watching them, they're a little more careful with how they handle things. Hmm. And, you know, a lot of it sounds like helping people through the legal process of things. Uh, is Are there other ways in which congregations get involved with this beyond the, the legal immigration going through all of that process? Well, congregations are accompanying families, and, um, and what they're helping them do is make sure that they can make the transition to their community. And what that means um, might be that if, if 
uh, a person, if a family is looking for um, uh, particular medical assistance, they will help them find the medical assistance that's available to people in their community. Um, they might, they will accompany people when they are um, trying to get their children um, actually in school, you know, registered for school. They'll make sure that they, uh, particularly where they, uh, where they don't um, have English speaking ability, they, they can help them through that process. That sounds like we got a heck of a lot more to talk about, and we do. Um, we're, there's something called the Guardian Angel Program that we're going to be talking about coming up as well. So this is a flame ministry here on the BBM Global Network and Tune In Radio. Stay tuned. We're coming right back. For over 50 years, Evelyn Stapula has been a loving advocate for people with disabilities throughout the state of Pennsylvania. President and founder of Big Heart Bridges, her organization actively campaigns for legislation and support of civil liberties that meet the needs of disabled individuals with housing, transportation, and employment. Ms. Stapula has joined forces with a variety of esteemed organizations that advocate for the disabled. She serves on the board of the United Cerebral Palsy of Pittsburgh and the Governor's Cabinet and Advisory Committee for People with disabilities, and she is a consultant for the Pennsylvania Governor's Conference for Women. Her many efforts have led to the implementation of a transportation program for the disabled with the Access Paratransit System of Allegheny County. Evelyn Stapoulis strives daily to serve the interests of the disabled, to protect their freedoms, and enable them to live normal public lifestyles. To learn more, please call 412-491-2605 or email Evelyn at ers92645 at verizon.net. Attorney Renee Marie Smith is changing the way we sell real estate. She wrote a series of books called My Short Sale Guru Guides for all real estate practitioners. Whether you're a homeowner wanting to understand the process, an agent who has been handling short sales for years, or an industry analyst wanting to know how short sales impact your business, Renee uses her vast real estate experience to take a comprehensive look at the recent market phenomena while relaying it in an easy-to-understand format. Through her company, Smith Title Services, Renee has counseled thousands of short sale participants and processed in excess of a thousand short sales. Her knowledge is transformational for real estate professionals and laymen alike, and her live presentations provide people the opportunity to ask specific questions about their issues. Buy her books and schedule her to speak at your next event. Visit www.smithtitleservices.com or call 305 705 3428 or email her at renee at smithtitleservices.com. Isn't it time to sell your property today? Learn the My Short Sale Guru way. Welcome back. This is uh, Flame Ministry. I am your host, Pastor Kathleen Panning, and we are here on a, a tune-in radio and uh, and look at, listening to uh, the show and working with uh, my guest today, which who is Mary Campbell, uh, the director for Amparo, uh, a ministry and program in the Evangelical Lutheran Church in America that deals with accompanying migrant minors in this country. And before the break, Mary, you were talking about uh, some of the ways in which uh, congregations can be involved in this program. Um, what are some of the things the program does or does not require of a congregation? We do not require a congregation to make a financial contribution um, um, in this case in terms of the welcoming congregations. Some congregations make a choice to do so if they have the funds, but one of the things Amparo does not require is that kind of a financial commitment um, because many congregations are finding themselves stretched, you know, in their budgets these days. And so um, it depends on where they are. So that's not one of the things that we require. Um, basically, what we require is that a congregation be willing to accompany the migrants in their, in their, in their communities. That's, that sounds, um, you know, that's really good. Um, you, you've you talked about and kind of hinted at the, that there is something called a, um, a guardian angel program. But before I say that, yeah, when you were talking about these congregations, you were talking about a congregation in Decorah, Iowa. Now, obviously, that means 
you don't have to be a congregation along the southwestern border to be a part of this. And so right. I would assume that this is open to congregations anywhere in the United States and maybe beyond that. Um, so, but um, yes, I know there's something um, so called the Guardian Angel. Yeah, yeah, the Guardian so Angel gonna, program. Would you let me know? Go ahead. Oh, I was just going to say um, that reminds me to to um, not not only share about what's happening in Decorah, but also talk about our border congregations because. They have been particularly stretched at this moment in time. Um, often we have congregations that are providing sh- overflow shelter services to their communities for the migrants that have been released by Customs and Border Patrol. And we have congregations that are actually accompanying those congregations by going to visit them and, and, and helping to provide assistance to those congregations as they provide shelter um, to others. So that's that's a way that our congregations actually find to work together. Um, you were mentioning the Guardian Angel Program, and um, as of today, I can say that actually as of this weekend, um, the ELCA now has um, nine Guardian Angel Programs nationally. Um, Guardian Angel Programs are programs that send church people to court. So church people become the physical presence of the church in the courtroom. Um, usually in pairs of two or three, no more than that, because immigration courts are often um, have very small spaces and we can't and we don't have uh, room for a large number of people. But what um, the nine guardian angel programs are doing nationally is accompanying uh, children and their sponsors, unaccompanied children who have come into the United States and their sponsors in courtrooms in their immigrate through their immigration process. Um, At this moment in time, we have Guardian Angel programs in Los Angeles. That was actually the original one. Chicago, we have now um, San Francisco, but we also have um, Denver, and we have um, Atlanta. We have Boston. We have Minneapolis, St. Paul, and Detroit um, as well, um, and Omaha, Nebraska. Uh, That's where our Guardian in Chicago. Mm -hmm. I don't know if I mentioned that. Um, But people go to court um, when children are scheduled for court and are present there um, with them. And why is that kind of a program important? It's an important program because many people who are going to court um, don't have lawyers and are, are very and are really frightened of the whole process, never having been in court before. Um, and even though translation is offered when people are in the courtroom, it's often very difficult. It's a scary situation. And for people to know that church people are there with them and accompanying them makes a big difference. So as we we have, this is an interfaith program, we have Episcopalians, we have Roman Catholics, we have Presbyterians and Lutherans all going to court. Um, We also, you know, have people from the Baha'i faith who are accompanying us, Jewish representatives. We have um, people going to court to be with people, pray with them for justice before they actually have to enter the courtroom and, and just our extra eyes in the courtroom to see what happens to people. Um, people are often intimidated in those situations and where they might want to ask for more time to get a lawyer, um, they need the encouragement to do that. And so um, having church people in the courtroom does make a very big difference. Um, a couple uh, stories recently, um, even though there's translation in the courtroom, it's often possible that people do not understand, uh, you know, because of because of whatever state of mind they might be in or however the translation might be, what's actually happening to them. Um, recently, in one of our guardian angel programs, um, a young man was in front of the judge alone and didn't understand what was happening, really. And judge even had asked him, you know, if he was, if he was fearful of, of, of going back to his home country, did not understand the question and answered it no. Um, so the judge said, well, then um, I will I will order that you voluntarily, um, you know, be returned to your home country. And as soon as that was said, he, he was like, but no, but no, you know, but I'm afraid. And and so it was good. It was really important that the guardian angels were there because then they were able to communicate that information to a lawyer um, who was a pro bono lawyer that happened to be not in the courtroom at that moment. But. In, in the waiting area, and so that that lawyer could intervene and help this person um, get the you know get this result reversed because because he really didn't understand what was happening to him. 
Wow. So th- there's a lot more to talk about, including your ecum- ecumenical work and international work. We've got, so please, folks, keep listening. This is a, um, BBM Global Network and Tune In Radio. We're coming right back. Do you battle with weight loss? There is a solution. Founder of Weight No More Consulting, Deborah Simons, can help you lose weight safely and effectively through weight loss surgery. I know. I had the surgery two years ago, and I am 135 pounds lighter and medication-free. This full-service weight loss center caters to your every need as you navigate to a healthy weight following surgery. Servicing all of Canada, Weight No More Consulting takes pride in its compassionate care and guides you through each step before and after surgery. Starting with informational meetings, Weight No More Consulting educates each potential client before they decide to have surgery on the health risks of obesity and the various weight loss surgeries available. After surgery, Weight No More Consulting provides a solid support system with ongoing meetings to ensure continued success. Deborah Simons and Weight No More Consulting are committed to promoting your health and wellness through maintaining a healthy weight for life. Welcome back. This is, um, I, well, I am Pastor Kathleen Padding, and this is a Flame Ministry here on the BBM Global Network and Tune In Radio. And uh, my guest has been and continues to be Mary Campbell, who is the program director for Amparo, a program in the Evangelical Lutheran Church of America, which is the ELCA, uh, dealing with accompanying migrant minors and their families. And Mary, we've been talking about uh, what this program is and uh, a lot of its work, and there's a lot more we can talk about. So what is... Something that we haven't really touched on yet that you would really want to make sure everybody hears and understands. Well, I would like people to know that um, principally the Amparo program and the strategy um, spends most of it, 65% of its um, funds, in helping people in countries of origin who have been deported from the United States and Mexico. Um, The deportations have have been on the rise, and we have lots and lots of children and families that are being deported back to countries of origin at this moment in time. Often when they come to back home, the first thing that happens is they might go to a government um, reception center, but they're usually only there for an hour or two, and then they're basically released back into the community, and many times with nothing more than a food basket and no promises of any kind of help. Um, Through the Amparo strategy, we have been able to support the work of companions in countries of origin in Honduras, Guatemala, and El Salvador so that they, so that people can find, first of all, safety, a a safe place to live in their communities, but secondly, the opportunity to, um, for income generating projects, which means maybe starting a small business. And in some cases, since some of these, uh, many of these kids are are young um, and, and want to go back to school, helping them get back into school, which in some countries is very difficult because migrants that are returned from the United States and Mexico are often stigmatized and find it difficult to get back in. And because of the trauma that they have suffered through the migrant journey, um, they often are in need of psychosocial trauma counseling. And so that's another aspect of these programs. Um, that we have, and and the ELCA is one of the few denominations that supports the, this kind of work that's happening um, in in these countries of origin. So it's kind of become our niche internationally. Um, these programs are extremely important, and, and and even though when the work was initially started, people were hoping that maybe there would be a fifty seven fifty percent success rate, and that maybe fifty percent of the migrants that went through the program would make the decision not to take the migrant journey again. But the recent results that we learned about in March of this year when we were in Central America is that these programs have between an 88 and 95% success rate. What this means is that 88 to 95% of the people who have uh, been returned are not thinking about making the migrant journey at this time. Now we know that that's maybe, that doesn't mean that they won't ever do it at some other point, at some other point in their lives, but they do not wish to risk their lives again and take the migrant journey. Um, on the ELCA Amparo Facebook page, you can hear some testimonies of some of these youth that we had a chance to talk with when we were recently in Central America. 
uh, what is uh, the web address for that web page so that people can go there and look at that? Our resources are can be found at www.elcas.org slash Amparo. Um, and you can find us on Facebook at ELCA Amparo. That's A-M-M-P-A-R-O. And to get the latest news, yeah, and to, um, and to, you can follow us on Facebook. Yeah, so to, to remind people, it stands for Accompanying Migrant Minors. Minors. Uh, so there's the two M, yeah, there's the two M's right. in Amparo when it's spelled for this program um, uh, instead of just one in the, as in the Spanish. Um, how does someone get get this, if, you know, if somebody is looking to get some of this started in a, a congregation, how do they do that? Well, what we have found is that often there's a small group of people that are extremely concerned about what's happening um, nationally today. Um, and we, we usually ask a person to look for like-minded people in their congregation that are as concerned as they are to, to start um, to get their congregation involved. And what they can become a welcoming congregation, um, provided their leadership is in agreement with them engaging in this kind of work. And most times um, and the leadership is interested. Um, and many times it's important for a small group to get things going because um, often there are people that have not had the experience of have, having any contact with migrants in their community. And so um, they, they're, they're kind of subject to the stereotypes that, every, that other people may have. But once they have the opportunity to engage um, with migrant community organizations in their communities, um, a conversion can take place and people can, um, and, and, and pretty soon they can get more and more people involved in their congregation. So um, usually we ask people to look for a small group um, and then talk with their leadership. Um, we have a commitment form on our ELCA resource page. We ask them to um, sign the commitment form. And indicate who's their contact person who will be in touch with them to receive the information about what's happening, um, and then and, and just get going by by looking in their their area, kind of mapping to see what's happening in their area with migrant community organizations, and engage as as they feel um, that they can. And so, is there any kind of training that they go through once they sign this commitment form and everything? Uh, uh, what happens from the the national church level? We don't specifically offer training, but we have a lot of educational resources available for people. We ask people to um, get up to speed and understand what's exa- what's happening, um, not only in countries of origin, but in transit and in the United States. Um, and so I know in one case, um, a particular pastor wanted, we felt really passionate about this issue, and he actually engaged in a six-month um, educational process where they had adult forums within different um, areas talking about different aspects of the migrant journey and also what's happening in the United States. And through that educational process, he had, at the end, he had about 12 people that said they were passionate about this and wanted to do it. His, his counsel said yes, you know, 12 people is a good number. And so they signed on as a welcoming congregation. Um, and then he said, well, um, he said, what's next? Uh, you know, I said, well, now you need to look at what's happening in your community. So in this particular case, um, he, they all thought they, had, they were under the illusion that all of the migrants in their community were on the other side of town. So they, took, they went across mm-hmm. town and, and visited a migrant community organization and uh, they said, well, we know we're from the wrong side, you know, basically of, of the town, but is there anything we can do to help? And the organization basically said, are you kidding? There are migrants in your community, and we would love, we were looking for an outreach center in your community. We would love to, you know, partner with your church if you're willing to and, uh, and do something, mm. you know, basically on the east side of town as opposed to the west side. And so that is how that congregation found themselves engaged in some really rich ministry. And now more and more of his congregation are, want to be involved in it. That, 
you know, the, I'm sure that you could tell us many, many, many stories as to what's going on in congregations. And um, it's a, an important story. The immigration issue continues to be in the headlines and everything. So um, we have more to share. So this is um, the BBM Global Network and Tune In Radio. Uh, you're listening to A Flame Ministry. We're coming right back. Do you battle with weight loss? There is a solution. Founder of Weight No More Consulting, Deborah Simons, can help you lose weight safely and effectively through weight loss surgery. I know. I had the surgery two years ago, and I am 135 pounds lighter and medication-free. This full-service weight loss center caters to your every need as you navigate to a healthy weight following surgery. Servicing all of Canada, Weight No More Consulting takes pride in its compassionate care and guides you through each step before and after surgery. Starting with informational meetings, Weight No More Consulting educates each potential client before they decide to have surgery on the health risks of obesity and the various weight loss surgeries available. After surgery, Weight No More Consulting provides a solid support system with ongoing meetings to ensure continued success. Deborah Simons and Weight No More Consulting are committed to promoting your health and wellness through maintaining a healthy weight for life. WikiWags brings harmony back into your home for male dogs and their owners. Inventor and entrepreneur Linda Jangula has created the disposable doggy diaper wraps made with the male dog in mind. The built-in wicking ability prevents rashing and other potential health issues for your dog. Each wrap comes in four sizes and has dual reattachable magic tabs for easy adjustments. And each size has a 7-inch logo strip for adjustability. So they are comfortable and easy to use. No more fuss, just leave the mess to us. Whether you're in or out, your dog will be free to run about. Stop cleaning and start enjoying your home, and you can even leave your dog alone. To order your WikiWags, visit WikiWags.com. Or to find out where to buy WikiWags in your town, visit MyWikiWags.com and start enjoying having man's best friend around. We are back. This is a Flame Ministry here on the BBM Global Network and Tune In Radio. Uh, I am Pastor Kathleen Panning, your host for the show. And my guest today is Mary Campbell, the Program Director for Amparo, uh, which is an ELCA strategy for accompanying migrant minors. Um, and it's it's spelled in this case with two M's, A M M P A R O. Um, Mary, you shared a lot with us about uh, all kinds of aspects of this program. We are fast running out of time here. Is there anything that we've missed? Anything that you want to leave as last thought with people? Well, what I'd like to say is that um, even though this program has seen amazing growth, we are still really interested in seeing more congregations and more synods and more um, more faith um, communities engage with Amparo. Um, we have uh, we the one of the most recent groups that has joined. It was an interfaith task force for immigration that's connected to one of the Gamaliel um, networks in the United States. Mm. And this interfaith um, group has been doing lots of great work in their community. But, was, but wanted to have a connection um, nationally and internationally for themselves so that they could even strengthen the work that they're doing. So we're very interested in any group that's um, passionate about immigration, um, any group, any joining us as, as part of Amparo. Um, when you join Amparo, you will have the opportunity to have to, to receive regular information about what's happening in countries of origin, transit, and in the United States. And you'll also have an opportunity to engage in advocacy. One of the things we haven't talked a lot about is, our, is the advocacy that occurs. Um, the ELCA is very blessed to have a program director for migration policy in Washington, D.C., and um, she is regularly engaged with the Interface um, Immigration Coalition and other coalitions in Washington, D.C. that are able to um, they're able to um, make the voice of faith uh, more clear um, in, um, around immigration issues in Washington, D.C. So I would encourage you to take a look at the resources that we have on our website 
And, and I would encourage any faith group that's interested in joining uh, the Amparo Network. One of the things we offer are small congregational and synodical grants for people to continue to, to expand the work what, uh, that they want to do in their communities. So what is your faith community's dream uh, for engaging with migrants in your community, and how can we all partner together to make this a reality? Uh, and, you know, one of the things that you talk about is the advocacy and everything. And I just want to let people know, you don't have to agree uh, or have a – people of all different political stances on the immigration issue can work with Amparo. Um, this is not about one, you know, political position, uh, right. view uh, on, on this. And uh, within the Evangelical Lutheran Church in America, there's many diverse views on this issue. So just know that this is not a this is a, a political advocacy type of I- issue from Amparo uh, itself. So thank you, Mary. It's been wonderful having you here. I, I invite people to reach out and uh, uh, to the uh, website, which is elca.org, uh, and then look for Amparo, A-M-M-P-A-R-O, uh, in the search bar or uh, mm-hmm. wherever on the, that website. And um, I'm sure, Mary, you are at um, elca.org as well for people to yes. get in touch with you uh, personally if they need to. Um, so, and can e- email you at its... Um, Right, Mary.Campbell Mary Campbell at ELCA.org. Okay, thank you for that. And uh, for people to get in touch with me, please go to my Facebook page, which is the Flame Ministry Consulting uh, on Facebook. Um, it's been great having you here. To all of you, blessings to you for this coming week. We'll be back again next week with another program. So come join us then. God's blessings. This has been a Flame Ministry with your host, Pastor Kathleen Panning. Tune in each week as Kathleen guides you through the many challenges that face our faith-based communities today as she ignites the ministry of your faith community so that more people can hear the message of God's love on Kathleen Panning's A Flame Ministry. been listening to the BBM Global Network. The ideas, views, and opinions of this broadcast are those of the participants of the program and are not necessarily the ideas, views, and opinions of the BBM Global Network Company.